wood. Amen. Amen. There is so much to study on that subject. And we just want to start with a prayer, Sister Delvin. Get right into God's Word. All right. Let us pray, friends. So that's going on here. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much. What a blessing it is to be alive in a time like ours. Thank you for the gift, the honor, the privilege, and the opportunity to worship God in such significant times. Thank you, God, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the furthering of the gospel message that you're doing with a desire that your children will give their all to Jesus. I thank you for my brethren who have joined. Thank you for their faithfulness, their steadfastness, and their love for the Lord. Thank you for the hunger and thirst they have for righteousness and their longing to walk forever with Jesus. As a forgiveness for keeping my brethren waiting, as we study, Lord God, we pray that you will be lifted up above all names, that you would purify us, pull us closer, and help us to be shining for God's glory till the end of time. Thank you for what you are about to do, my Lord. May your name always be praised is our prayer. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, friends. Welcome once again, and what a privilege is ours to be studying such significant truths. Our theme for appreciation through all these past weeks has been the end time power. We're recognizing how God is wanting to prepare a people, anchor them down deep, and just ready them for the finishing of the work that God has in store for his people. Well, let me start you off with an interesting account, at least two very interesting accounts that, that took place recently. In San Francisco, developers built a beautiful skyscraper. And as this skyscraper was set up, it was built with these condominiums inside. Each of them, those condominiums, was selling for millions each. Huge skyscraper and these these condominiums inside of them just selling for millions a piece let me see if i can even show you the picture of the building there it is huge tall skyscraper in san francisco and all of these condominiums in it selling for millions each but quickly the skyscraper came into the news it it caught it caught the attention of of, of the people why because you see this tower was found to be sinking and tilting on one end, only to find out that they had built this skyscraper on the ruins of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And that's what they started building this tower upon. As such, the building began sinking, it began to tilt, and to solve the problem, they, it had been proposed that they had to sink 12 deep piers down through the ruins of, of the old city to bedrock it so that the stability can be obtained. But that's what happened. The building was beginning to sink and it was beginning to tilt. Surely the developers <clears throat> did not want happening what happened a few years ago in China. I don't know if you're familiar with that as well. Here's a building. Here's the, 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 the picture of a building and, and what happened to it. Uh, just prior to the skyscraper in San Francisco, there it was, the building on the ground. Whoa, what had happened? This is June 2009. Is it was a it was an account that took place in eastern Shanghai. To the workers' surprise, a new tall apartment building just toppled over. It just toppled over. Again, poor planning and development were blamed. In other words, friends, it's plain to see that from these examples, there are important factors to consider in building so that what you build will last, will last for a long time. In fact, notice what the Bible says, friends, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11, the Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, 
which is Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, our study for today is entitled Building with God. And what we're going to do, friends, through this series of study also is that for the next maybe a, maybe at least two or at least at least two weeks, we will, or at least two or three weeks, we're gonna try and understand how in the Bible the Lord speaks of different builders. And these builders have a very important message to share with God's people. The experience of these builders and the building that they were building have a very significant message for us. Just as God is building us and empowering us with His end time power to be able to stand at the end of time, to be able to stand as God's faithful people at the end of time. To begin with, friends, we're going to take a look at the story of David and Solomon, particularly Solomon. Now, you would remember King David's story. He had desired to build a temple for the Lord. I'm going to talk about this towards the end. And instead, he is not given permission, but Solomon, his son, goes out to build a temple. And of course, his temple is now known as the Solomon's Temple. Of course, that's a misnomer. That is not the correct name. It should be the Lord's Temple built by Solomon. But of course, in, in common terms, it's known as Solomon's Temple. So Solomon builds a temple. Temple, you know, makes, it, it gets great fame, including Solomon. Solomon also gains great fame because of his wealth and his, 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 his wisdom. But then Solomon's Temple is also unrivaled in its beauty, of its grandeur. In fact, let's notice some truths about the building and the construction of this temple. Let's read about it in 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 7. Notice, notice this very important truth. 1 Kings chapter 6, and we're particularly looking at verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, the Bible says, The house when it was building, referring to the temple Solomon was building, that the house when it was building was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither. So that there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the place while it was building. I mean, that in itself is an architectural marvel. How not an, how not an axe, a tool of iron was heard in the house, not a hammer heard in the house when it was being built. But wait a minute. It says, the house, when it was being built, what was happening? That it was built of stone, but notice the stones had to be made ready. When the stones were ready, that's when they were brought to its right place and put in place so that everything went smoothly and there was no obstructions. But in order for that to happen, the stones for the temple had to be made ready. Isn't that interesting, friends? God saying something to us about how the temple is built right when the stones for the temple are made ready. When they're ready, they can be put into its right place and fill out the work they are supposed to fulfill in the building of the temple. Interestingly, notice what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us on the subject. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says, You also are what? Are as lively stones. You are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Isn't the Bible amazing, friends? In Kings, we're reading that the stones have to be made ready before they are placed. And Peter says, brethren, you are lively stones and are built up a spiritual house. But notice, friends, in order for the stones to be part of the temple building, listen carefully. The temple is the church of God. That's, the, that's God's temple, God's church. In order for God's church to be able to stand firm, to be able to stand anchored, friends, you cannot put in stones that are not ready, that are unshaped, that are not chiseled. And while the chiseling, the cutting, the shaping is a painful process, it's a much needed process if you want to keep the building from toppling over. If you want the building to stand firm and steadfast, you have to put it through this painful, laborious process. The Bible tells us when the stones were complete, when the stones were ready, that's when they were able to build a perfect, firm, a steadfast house. Peter picking up the same analogy, he's saying, brethren, you, just in case you have any doubts, 
the temple building by Solomon was representative of God's people who when they are ready they can be rightly fit into the greater family of God into the greater church of God so that they can keep the house in their right place keep the house from falling apart keep the house in its right place you can be built up into a spiritual house isn't that powerful and friends that's what we've been studying about the Holy Spirit's desire not just to tell us what's coming but to prepare us is somebody listening what have you been studying? That the work of the Holy Spirit is not just to tell us about things to come, but to prepare us, to make us ready. Because when we're ready, friends, when we receive the latter rain, we will go forth and build that even a greater body of believers, greater stones, a greater number of stones, which are believers, who will be brought into the church of God and fill their right place. Hence the question, friends. Scripture is, is imploring us to ask ourselves, am I allowing the Lord? You see, stones did not make themselves ready. Are you listening to this? There's such a powerful analogy here. The stones did not shape themselves. The stones did not give themselves the right shape and the right fit. It was the builder who was giving the stones the right shape. Friends, if the church belongs to God and the Lord is the builder, are you submitting yourself to the chiseling, the molding, the perfecting, the stoning process, the polishing process, so that God can make you perfectly fit where your right place is in the church of God so that you can fulfill the responsibility God has for us at the time? Now, Scripture tells us that when this temple was built, the temple that Solomon was building, when the temple was complete, Solomon hosted this he carried forth a great dedication and in this dedication he brought up the ark of the lord let's pick up the story in second chronicles chapter 5 and verse 2 notice what the scripture says second chronicles chapter 5 and verse 2 the bible says then solomon assembled the elders of israel and all the heads of the tribes the chief of the fathers of the children of israel unto jerusalem for what purpose to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. So wait a minute. Stones are prepared. They're put in place. And when they are in place, that's when the Ark of God is brought into the temple. I hope you're following through. In verse 3, the Bible says, Wherefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king. And what month was this? This was the seventh month. Now that is just beautiful. The Bible says, so they all gathered, <clears throat> and as they gathered to go get the ark, the Bible says it was in fact the seventh month. Now, does someone know what is so significant about the seventh month? If anybody is familiar with scripture, what is so significant about the seventh month in scripture? Friends, the seventh month also happens to be the month when it is the time for the day of atonement. Tenth day of the seventh month used to be the Day of Atonements. The first 10 days used to be the Feast of Trumpets. And then came the seventh month. Rather, that then came the 10th day of the seventh month, which was the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment. And that is also, listen carefully, that is also the day when the priest would enter the most holy place near the Ark of God, into the presence of the Lord, as God would pronounce judgment upon the rest of Israel. So it's amazing. The people are now notice stones are ready, put in place. When they're in place, God's ark is being brought. And what did the ark represent? The ark represented the presence of God. The God, the ark of the covenant, is where God's glory came. God rested upon the ark of the covenant, and that's where He spoke to Israel from, from on top of the ark of the covenant. Now, friends, it's amazing that. When the people are ready, when the stones are ready, put in the right place and the temple is built, that's when the ark is brought in. That's when all the men of Israel assemble and it's the seventh month. And they're going out to get the ark of the Lord. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 4. Notice what the Bible says, 2 Chronicles 5 and verse 4. The Bible says, and all the elders of Israel came. And the Levites took up the ark. Verse 5 says, They brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels 
that were in the tabernacle, these did the priests and the Levites bring up. Now that's interesting. The holy vessels are also being brought into the tabernacle. This is really beautiful. At the time of the Day of Atonement, the ark which is denoting the presence of God, along with the holy vessels, they are brought into the Lord's house. Very interesting. They are being brought into the Lord's house. Now, notice what is taking place in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 12. Notice what the Bible tells us. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 12. Here's what the Bible says. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 12. The Bible says, Also the Levites, which were the singers, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests, they were sounding with trumpets, welcoming the presence of the Lord. Friends, let's put this together. The temple is finished when the stones are ready. The ark, which represents the presence of God, is brought into the place prepared for him. Wait a minute. But the temple is finished when? When the lively stones, which was who? God's people. In a greater measure, this building, like we said, these builders, in this case Solomon, have such important vital lessons to teach us. In this case, the building that Solomon is building, the temple he's building, it is only finished when God's, the stones rather, I keep, I keep going to the spiritual analogy here, but the, the temple is finished when the stones were ready to be put in the right place. Friends, this temple, this church and its work is finished when the stones ready themselves to be a part of that, that, that last, that to be a part of that last work, that last church that is going to bring an, an, an end to the, the gospel work that God has given us. Understand, friends, when his people are ready, God's presence moves into them. He is brought into the place prepared for them. Notice, friends, in a unique way, notice this also. As the people are readying themselves, it, they're preparing themselves for what? For the presence of the Lord. Notice this. They're preparing themselves. They're coming together. They're getting themselves right. Hearts are being cleansed. Sins are being washed. Forgivenesses and repentance is being presented to the Lord. Why? Because they want God's presence to fill their lives like never before. And friends, on the Day of Atonement, when the priest would indeed enter into that presence of the Lord, in the immediate presence of the Lord, in the, in the most holy place, in the Ark of the Covenant, that day, as sins and everything was put away, people and God came into a very unique relationship. No wonder the day was called Atonement, which means at one meant. That's how the word can be read. Atonement can be read as at one meant. As sins were kept away, because the previous 10 days, remember, in the first 10 days of the seventh month, people were preparing themselves. The trumpets would sound. It was the Feast of Trumpets. And it would warn the people, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. The Day of Judgment is coming. People would humble themselves, make themselves ready. When they were ready, they were presented before God on the Day of Atonement. And sins were dealt with. As a result, God could now be one with them like never before in the year. Are you listening? Not that there was no forgiveness any part of the earth, but now the all sins were just done away. Israel became at, at oneness with God like never before. Brothers and sisters, are we doing all we can? Listen to me very carefully. Are we doing all we can to prepare ourselves? Are we doing all we can to submit ourselves to the preparatory process into the hands of the potter? Doesn't the Bible tell us, can the clay ask the potter, why have you made me like this? Can we complain to the Lord when he allows us to go through these trying, chiseling, perfecting processes? Rather, we should ask the Lord, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, kind and true. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Friends, we can be at one minute with the Lord. Notice this is the appeal of the Lord, that if we allow this end time power, the Holy Spirit, to work with us, to strive with us, to cleanse us, to show us our sin, to convict us, but also to convert us. As the Holy Spirit has its perfect way, 
strives and gives us the victory that we seek, we can be brought into the immediate presence of the Lord. We can be at oneness with Him like never before. Notice then also, friends, holy vessels are also brought into the place prepared for them in the place of God. Now this is interesting. While the stones represented the individuals, holy vessels are being spoken of. Holy vessels are being spoken of. Friends, this can also represent the people of God also. Remember what Paul says? We have this treasure. Come with me to the book of Corinthians as we, as we explore this, this truth as well. Notice Paul's word. You'll need your Bibles for this one. Uh, these are the words of Paul. And we read about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we read verse 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7. We've read these verses before. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7 says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure, the treasure of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are the earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now notice, friends, going back, going back to our summary of, of, of the, the building of, of, of Solomon, we find that the temple is finished when the stones are ready. And when the stones are ready, God can move in with them. God can come closer to them. God can be at oneness with them like never before. Now, because the temple is ready, the holy vessels can also now be brought in into the place prepared for them. If you've been paying attention to our whole series, you are very familiar. You should be by now very familiar with what you're talking about. When God's people, when God's church is ready, they are submitting themselves to the Lord, receiving the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When they're ready, they are part of a church that receives that fullness, that latter rain experience, the presence of God. And as the Spirit of God possesses them, they are a temple. Remember 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. As we get ourselves ready, the God moves in in the latter rain and possesses us. When He possesses us, we can go forth and in the loud cry, what are we doing? We are reaching out to a people who are submitting themselves to the Lord, being made holy vessels. Just as we were being made holy by the Lord through like the lively stones in the temple, we also have individuals who are being made holy by the Lord as holy vessels who in the loud cry, people from different faiths, as they receive the word of God, as they receive Christ and are cleansed and purified and made holy by the Lord, they are also brought into the place that is prepared for them in the temple. Oh, it's amazing. Can you see the progression of events again? Even in the building that is taking place even in the building of the temple we see a progression the church of god is being built and the way it is being built it is teaching us the work the church has to do stones have to be ready so that they can be part of the the, the final work the finishing god's presence moves in in the latter rain in that glorious fashion and god's people go out preparing those who have been made holy by the lord giving them the message of the lord and they are brought into the house of god to fit the place that God has prepared for them. Amazing. And as the presence of God enters, what's happening? The trumpets are blowing. Oh, the trumpets are blowing, friends. Glory, glory, glory be to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? As, 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 as the Lord's presence moves in, what do we find? We find that the trumpets are blowing. Do you still remember Gideon's story? At night, when they broke the vessels, earthen vessels, right? And as the earthen vessels broke, the, the trumpet was being blown, remember? And we saw the application. This is God's people. This is God's people. When they shatter self, this earthen vessel, they, their selfishness. When self is shattered, if we are earthen vessels, self has to be shattered. So that the lamp that was in the vessel, in Gideon's story, the light that was in the vessel, which is Jesus, the light of the world, we have Jesus, the light of the world, in these earthen vessels. Only when our selfishness is destroyed, Christ the light can shine through. We can blow the trumpets. What is that? Giving people the call. The trumpets were an instrument that were given, that were used to give warning. They were also used to send out messages. You would remember the crier, the, the herald of God, would go forth. And as he would go forth being the herald, there would be, I guess, a person playing the trumpet, getting everyone's attention to listen to the message. 
Oh, what beautiful, what beautiful imagery. Let's look at that imagery again. As the Lord teaches us this very, very beautiful truth. Stones are made ready. Temple is finished. Church is ready. As the church is making itself ready, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, moves in. The Holy Spirit possesses them. And as the Holy Spirit possesses them, as and the Holy Spirit is only able to possess because there is a place that is prepared for the ark. Do you get that point? When we in our hearts prepare a place, we empty ourselves of self and make a place for God in our lives. He can move in and possess us. As the stones are made ready, they receive the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. As the latter rain is received, they go forth looking for more holy vessels, looking for more lively stones, and bring them into the right place that is made for them in the house of God. And as this is taking place, what's, his ha what, what's happening? The trumpets are also blowing. The word is going out. People are being invited. The word is going out as the presence of God is entering. The trumpets are blowing. And the message is going out. The call is being sent forth for more holy vessels to come and have their right place in the house of God, along with the presence of God. Friends, even the building of the temple tells us how God seeks to build his church at the end of time to be doing a very, very special work. Now notice, friends, this is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. Again, we find in Second Chronicles 5 and verse 13, going back to the story of Solomon, notice what the Bible says. It says, it came to pass, even as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Interesting. As the trumpets are blowing, as the call is going forth, right? The end time message. As the people of God are giving praises and thanksgiving through the difficult seasons of tribulation and, and distress, as they do this, the Bible tells us that the house is filled with a cloud, which is again, indeed, the presence of the Lord. And now, at the dedication, Solomon offers a prayer. And notice what happens after Solomon offers a prayer. This is so, so powerful. God is in the right place. Notice, this is, this, this is the, the other application. God is in the right place. Stones are ready. People, when they made themselves ready, God is in the right place in their hearts. When God is in the right place in their hearts, he's being brought in. As he's being brought in, the trumpets are blowing. The call is now going out, the loud cry. But notice, what, what is really making the loud cry? Or what is giving power to the trumpets? Notice, as Solomon prays, we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. As Solomon prays, the Bible says, after he prays, when Solomon had made an end of praying, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Isn't that just beautiful? At the end of praying, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. What a beautiful imagery, friends. What a beautiful, beautiful imagery. In answer to prayer, fire comes from heaven. Does that sound familiar? Acts chapter 2. Disciples are together. They're praying to the Lord. As they pour forth their heart to the Lord, fire comes down from heaven and fills them. The Bible, in fact, goes on to say in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 2. Notice this. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 2. The Bible says, The priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. The glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Fire came down. Glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Brothers and sisters, the question today's message raises before us is are we a people who because of poor planning will be a people who will topple over? We will think, we will, we will tilt, we will sink because we don't have the right foundation. We're built on ruins. It's just like the skyscraper in San Francisco, built on the ruins. Friends, are we built on the ruins of self or are we built on the solid rock, Jesus Christ? Are we stones submitted to the builder or are we stones rebelling against the builder? Are we being perfected by the Lord 
Or are we giving ourselves over to our own volition, to our own ways, to our own corruptions, thereby keeping ourselves from being made ready for the fulfillment and the final work that God is wanting to do in our midst? Again, friends, the Lord appeals to his people today. The Lord appeals to his people today for he wants us to be a people built right for the Lord so that we can fulfill our right place. That when God is in the right place, as we give forth, as we call forth, as we praise the Lord, as we pray, the fire from heaven can come down, the latter rain, and the house can be filled, the church of God can be filled with God's glory to go forth and give the message of the Lord to the world. What a beautiful reminder. Solomon's story is such a beautiful reminder of the work we all need to be a part of. But friends, I want you to pay attention to something. We'll take a few more minutes as we close. If you remember the story, I told you we'll, we'll revisit this. In, in, in the experience of David, you would remember David wanted to build the Lord a temple. He wanted to build the Lord a temple. And I'd like you to pick up the story in 1 Chronicles 28. You'll find this in your Bibles. You need your Bibles for this. In 1 Chronicles 28, and I want you to listen to this. The, the words of David in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 2. See, the Bible says, David the king stood upon, their, upon his feet and said, Hear my brethren and my people, as for me, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. Now that's interesting because David, the Bible tells us, was so zealous to build for the Lord that he had made even the, the preparations ready, he had the materials ready to build the Lord a temple. But you see, friends, in David's life, something had happened. David had been walking with God. David had done great things and experienced great things with the Lord. And then David came to the point where he was on that rooftop, beheld Bathsheba, gave in to the sin given to the temptation, and as he gave into the temptation, took someone else's wife, murders her husband, takes her in, has to lie, has to cheat, does do all of these things. Of course, right after that, Nathan visits him and rebukes him, and, and David then pens that penitent psalm in Psalm 51, as he asks God for forgiveness and pleads for the Lord not to take his Holy Spirit away from him. But I want you to notice something, friends. Even though David was forgiven, his relationship was restored, God gave an example of David as someone who was close to the Lord after he had been restored. As an example of what God can do to bring restoration to our lives, but pay very close attention, friends. When David wanted to build the Lord a temple, after going through all this experience, when he wanted to build the Lord a temple, let's read about it in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 3. As he wants to build the Lord a temple, he says, you know, I had, I had made ready for the building. That's what he says in verse 2 of 1 Chronicles 28. But verse 3 says, But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name. And he wouldn't be below. That doesn't make sense. But does that mean he's not forgiven? No, that does not mean he's not forgiven. No, God forgave him, restored him. But look, that, does that mean David will not be in heaven? Of course, that's not what it means. But Lord, does that mean you don't love him enough as you did before? Absolutely not. But God, what does this mean? He's asking to build a temple. Why can't he build a temple? The Lord gives him a reason. In verse 3, he says, Because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. Shed blood. In other words, friends, the choices we make, the choices David made, brought him to a point in his life. Listen carefully to me now, friends. The choices David made brought him to a point in his life after which David would be forgiven. David would be in heaven. But David would not be allowed to do great and mighty things for the glory of God. Sure, he will do some things for God's glory, but he won't be entrusted with the greater things, the marvelous things God initially wanted to accomplish, but because of sins, personal choices, he had cut himself off. Salvation will be there, but not the joy of doing those great and wondrous things. And friends, that's the appeal and the warning I send you away today. We may be saved, but to a true Christian, for a true Christian, he's not just looking, a true Christian is not just looking to be saved. 
A true Christian is saying, Lord, heaven or not, what I want to know is what can I do for you here? What great things can I accomplish for you here? What great glory can I bring to your name here while I'm still alive? What more can I do for God's glory? And David's example is a, a testimony to us that we can bring ourselves to a point, we can sin and engage in, in, in this frivolous nature so much to bring ourselves to the point after which we can be forgiven but not entrusted with the glorious works of the Almighty. It is my appeal to you, friends. May we not allow the devil to destroy what the Lord is building. May we not allow the devil to take away, to steal away, to rob us of the precious privileges God wants to give us. Would you like to be that individual who is doing a great work for God in these last days? If that's you, can I invite you to kneel with me as we pray? If you're able, let us kneel, friends, as we pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again. What a beautiful story of building. And Lord God, how you want to make us ready as lively stones so that your presence can fill our hearts. That as we seek you in prayer and dedicate ourselves to you, fire from heaven, the Holy Spirit can come forth and we can go tell the world about Jesus. Father, help us to be part of that spiritual temple, that spiritual family of the Lord, to fulfill our right places in the work of God. Bless my brothers and sisters. Please possess them with your Holy Spirit. Please put an end to everything the enemy is doing to keep them from doing more for God's glory. And I pray, God, that they may long and thirst and hunger to do more and yet more for the honor of his name. Thank you, Father. Thank you for these blessings. Help us to be built rightly for God's glory. In Jesus' name, amen.